Um, I, so I was going to say a couple of things. Um, I know a number of people have said, God, this being locked in is making me, driving me crazy. And actually, I have been having a pretty good time actually until the beginning of May because I was scheduled to travel. But before that, um, I had in March, I was in Savannah, Georgia, and New York. And in Savannah, I photographed a number of things, including this really large black cemetery. And it occurred to me after I had photographed it two or three days that I've been photographing cemeteries for 30 or 40 years. And the source of that was because my great grandfather, Albert Watts, started a cemetery in Atlanta in 1889 um, that um, was, uh, before that, uh, uh, black people were, the only place to could be buried was in the swamp. And so he was actually able to start a cemetery. And, and I remember visiting it when I was young and it was probably one of the first places I photographed when I became a photographer. So anyway, um, I've been looking at sort of the cemetery work and, and delving, uh, swimming in the archive. And um, about a month ago, my friend Emmanuel, who is a, um, a scholar, a French scholar at the University of Rennes, who is uh, very interested in African-American and popular culture and music. And he's writing an article about Lemonade, the film that Beyonce made in uh, uh, 2016. And, um, I, and, and actually, people I trusted said, you should see it, you'd really like it, and, and knowing that I have an interest in New Orleans. But I hadn't done it, I, you know, it was kind of hard to find. So anyway, I finally had looked at it because what he was interested in was me adding some of my images from New Orleans to this article he's writing. So I started screening it and I made um, screenshots of the film and I, I kind of never thought about Beyonce one way or the other. You know, I think probably the, as a couple of my friends who don't like her, the worst thing about her is she's a superstar. But I was actually really impressed with both her and the fact that the movie, uh, the co-star of the movie really was Louisiana and New Orleans culture. So I'm gonna show you a couple of the pictures of her kind of in different guises. And, and the film, well, I had heard that the film was partly about her calling out Jay-Z, her husband, for cheating on her. And when I first saw it, I thought that was the least interesting thing about the film. Although as I watched it more, it became interesting because it became partly about that, but then also kind of redemption and forgiveness and also glorifying um, African-American women. And so uh, we're they're actually not going to do this format, but I started, um, they had re requested this idea of, um, pairing up some of my images from stills from the film. And in some cases, I kind of use the motif. Sometimes I kind of had the dialogue being in sort of some kind of contrast. So it, when it got, and, and to do this, of course, I had to kind of go deep into the 25 years I've been photographing in New Orleans. It's interesting that New Orleans has kind of been my imagination in that um, I um, uh, grew up in Seattle and there was a lot of people from Louisiana came west during World War II. Uh, and in, in Seattle, there was a, on New Year's Day, there was this pattern where people would have this progressive dinner where you'd go to people's houses. And it was started by New Orleans transplants. And then funny, it was going on till just recently in Seattle and was no longer happening in uh, New Orleans. And I thought what was interesting to me was this idea about what people bring with them when they go from one place to the other, the great migration. But sometimes things get kind of locked in amber in the destination where they might be more dynamic in the past. So um, I'll just, I'm just going to show you quickly sort of some of the images of New Orleans, which in some ways is a state of mind. Um, it's also, people say it's probably the most African city in, in uh, the Western Hemisphere. This is a memorial for um, Marie Laveau in the Voodoo Spiritualist Center. And it's funny, when I went in, I asked the proprietress, I said, can I take a photograph of this? And she looked at me and looked at my camera and giggled. And I took this photograph and that plow bell I used never worked again. So I guess it was the price I had to pay um, to sort of delve, to, that was the price I had to pay to delve into the culture. Uh, 
I think the um, uh, New Orleans was always sort of on my mind, partly because uh, both of my parents are from the South and I've always been interested in, um, well, I remember when I was seven or eight, we went to see my grandparents in Atlanta. And I said to my father, I said, you mean storefront churches and barbershops with people talking stuff is not just limited to the black area of Seattle. And my father said, well, you know, it came from somewhere. And so a lot of the base, when I became a photographer, the place, first place I went was West Oakland because there was immediate evidence of the fact that the Southern roots of a lot of people that settled there. And that's something I photographed. So I had a, I had a gig actually to do something in New Orleans and I wanted to go. And I've actually, that was in 1994 and I've probably been about 20 times since then and did a book that you'll see later. But I was really interested in kind of evidence in the landscape of um, references to music, which is a sort of a, a important part of the culture. Um, it's a former French colony, which some people say is the reason why jazz um, developed there because it was not suppressed as it was in a lot of the rest of the United States. It's also kind of the brass band is also a kind of instrument of political thought. This was actually in the Treme, taken I think about 2002, uh, uh, protesting the gentrification of this traditionally African American community. So the first time I was there in '94, I remember hearing music and I followed it to this housing project, Iberville, and there was a wake going on, and it turned out um, uh, this is actually a collage photograph, but. Uh, the woman with a t-shirt son had died at sea and it was sort of my introduction to the idea of, of death being both a, uh, a sort of vehicle of a mourning but also of celebration and these kids were better musicians than a lot of my friends who've been playing all their lives so it's sort of like New Orleans if you can't play you don't play in public And uh, people have said that the sort of way people move to the second line of the music has its roots uh, definitely in kind of African movement. And I know a number of uh, choreographers who have done studies of kind of the, the connections between the way people move in Senegal and Haiti and Cuba and in New Orleans. This is Uncle Lionel, who was the dr bass drummers of the Treme Brass Band. And the idea of musicianship is a kind of skill passed on from father to son. And um, also, uh, this is actually the Holt Cemetery, and this is one of the few cemeteries in New Orleans that has graves in the ground. It's an uh, African-American cemetery that was actually, uh, at, uh, actually in pretty bad shape before the storm um, and then really was damaged and was actually restored because of that. This is what it looked like in probably about 2002 or three. And um, the presence of Fats Domino is everywhere. This is actually Claiborne that has a freeway that sort of now cut the um, Treme sort of off from the, the French Quarter, which had elements that were African-American, much like has happened in uh, Richmond and a lot of other places, really Oakland, uh, where freeways become a kind of social engineering tool. So in about 1998 or nine, my friend John O'Neill said, you need to go see Frank uh, Fats Domino's house in the Lower Ninth Ward, someplace I didn't know. And so the picture on the upper, um, Right was taken in 89, uh, upper left, I'm sorry, upper left was 89, upper right was in 2005 after the storm. The lower right was also some graffiti because it was believed he had died in the storm. And then in about um, 2006 or seven, um, the, the, his house, which he actually moved into before he died, um, was the source of kind of, of community organizing. It turns out he didn't uh, die in this. He was rescued by helicopter. And this I took about 
four or five years ago at the New Orleans Film Festival, there was a film uh, premiered about him, and that's Dr. John in the Middle and uh, John Bartholomew, who was his musical director. So I sort of felt like I was in the presence of royalty. This is a, a, a um, mannequin of uh, Ernie K. Doe, who had a hit mother-in-law, who died probably about 15 years ago, but his wife got this um, mannequin that she kept uh, at the mother-in-law lounge. And the rumor was that he had was lost in Hurricane Katrina, but they were talking about the mannequin. This is actually from a lecture I did in France, but this is, um, so I was actually supposed to do a residency at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art in 2005. And in fact, I was gonna go there in the middle of the summer and I think I was finishing a book project, so I was delayed. And then Hurricane Katrina hit and um, uh, I got there about six weeks after the storm. But this is actually a photograph taken in the base of a, a uh, transport plane where people were being evacuated from New Orleans from a Superdome. Um, and it sort of seemed to be symbolic of something else, which I thought was really interesting. And, and those kind of references you see a lot. So, the, the, so first, when it, took, it was hard to get into New Orleans. And when I got there, the damage was much worse than the, all the coverage I'd seen in the New York Times. It's one of those things where for a couple of minutes I said, maybe I shouldn't photograph because photographs don't always tell the truth, but I got over that. And this is on Claiborne. It's funny, um, somebody's been posting uh, Jim, James Baldwin's book in the midst of what's been going on recently. And this is a reference, you can see J James Baldwin, but this is basically right after the, the, the New Orleans flooded from the storm and kind of referencing both James Baldwin and the biblical um, uh, expression that it came from. So FEMA was sort of doing um, a survey, both of both people and animals. Um, uh, some of, this is in the Lower Ninth Ward, which was sort of interesting that the idea of what was left and then um, the the idea that um, refrigerators actually became lethal. Some of them exploded because they were kind of food was left in them and became lethal objects. And people were doing editorial comments about FEMA. I think they've done that more recently. This is actually an abandoned school and it showed multiple flooding. Same thing here in uh, another part of New Orleans. And this is actually at the Martin Luther King uh, Library and School. This is um, City Park. Um, it's interesting, I always go to this fountain, um, but this is right after the storm and the fountain actually was never as beautiful as it was right after the storm with all the branches and everything. This woman, I, I was, um, it's funny, I was in the lower ninth and all these photographers were skulking around and not acknowledging each other, but I saw this guy doing a pastel um, of this ruin. And as we were as talking to them, it turned out he teaches at the museum school. And I think this drawing was in the New Yorker later. But uh, this woman show, uh, drove up and she had just come from Dallas and her father had built the house behind her and she was seeing it for the first time. Who's the and artist from the museum school? What's that? Uh, I have to look it up. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look. I can't, don't ask me to remember names. My friend Kathy okay. Sloan is in the audience and she knows. I'll, I'll send it to you privately or, okay. or maybe you'll forget it. <laughs> okay. Um, so somebody beckoned us over to this garage and we took us up to the second floor and someone in the garage had kept fighting dogs and had chained them to the second floor thinking he could pick them up after the storm. But the storm uh, drowned them, as you can see. And that happened to a lot of people. I, I sort of both fortunately and unfortunately did not get to see any bodies, but this was pretty upsetting anyway. And this idea of kind of the deatrice that was left to people's lives. So what happened was, especially in the Ninth Ward, that a canal broke and raised this huge barge and then sort of settled it down on the school bus. This is St. Rock's. 
um, which is a, a, a area, a neighborhood in New Orleans. And St. Rock is the patron saint of miracle cures. And in the chapel, which actually I'd gone to before the storm, was this incredible kind of uh, space that people uh, must have been cured because they certainly left a lot of braces and, and crutches. It's funny, New Orleans with its, its climate, um, a lot of spaces before and after the storm didn't look much different because the climate's really hard on, on spaces. This is a crash that I think I took uh, probably in 2003, and then I went back and revisited it after the storm. And this is what the chapel looked like right after the storm. Um, and it was, a, and, and I remember a woman was crying and saying they'll never come back, but it was restored. And this is actually kind of a photograph. You can see I'm moving between color and black and white. I think I was, I wanted to view New Orleans in black and white primarily because of its reference to time, but I also shot a lot of color, but I, I ostensibly to note take, but I think sometimes co color describes things differently. This is housing projects. Um, that actually was not very damaged, but almost immediately the um, uh, powers that be fenced them off and closed them off because they did not want the residents who are primarily poor and black to return where this was actually viable housing. So some of it got torn down. You can see here it's fenced off. That was the first picture was taken six weeks after the storm and the one on the right was taken uh, about nine months after. So this is all mostly the Ninth Ward and sort of efforts to organize and to kind of restore. And I think people were suspicious and they, they because they knew people saw this as an opportunity to um, do kind of real estate speculation. And so people were, it was really important, A, that some people had stayed and also that people wanted to sort of um, viable. This is actually the, the basement of this uh, junior, Martin Luther King Junior High School. The schools in New Orleans were not really great except for music. They had incredible music education. That was a flooded basement. So uh, it took me a while actually to even get access to the Lower Ninth Ward. In fact, I had to get um, embedded with the National Guard. These are two young women from Tacoma who had just come back from Iraq and actually said that um, New Orleans was much more upsetting to them than it, than it had been being in Iraq, just because it was home. So here I am. It, someone handed me a, a, a rifle, which I looked at and then returned. I was not interested in the rifle. I'll stop. This is um, someone from, the, I can't remember now, this private security company that, um, was also in, it was all over New Orleans, but I think it was in New York after 9-11. And there was sort of controversy because they were, a lot of these were ex-army um, officers who were making a lot more money as pr in private security. And they were all over New Orleans. So I actually had, it was in an exhibit um, at NYU that Deb Willis uh, organized of, of photographers who had photographed New Orleans and Katrina. And I remember there were a number of photographers there from New Orleans who were complaining about people that came to New Orleans during, after Katrina, made books and left. And, but they did say to me, they liked my work because they, I had been there for a longer period of time. And some of them have become my really good friends and said, come back for the first uh, Mardi Gras because I will show you uh, parts of New Orleans that you, know, you have to have connections to, to do. Because at this point, I had been, go been going there for nine or 10 years. Um, and it's, it's interesting, I like to go to a place repeatedly because every time you go more and more layers. And on some level, I wish I'd known about this earlier, but it was probably, I was exposed to this just when I needed to be. This is actually on Mardi Gras morning, the first Mardi Gras after Hurricane Katrina, which was actually in 2007, because I don't think they had one right um, the, the, after, the year before. And this is on the, um, uh, compound of the Harrisons. Uh, Donald Harrison, fought her, her, this woman's uh, father was one of the Mardi Gras Indian chiefs, but this is a West African tradition of pouring libations to the ancestors. So they were both 
uh, pouring out lambations to the ancestors and the kids you see dressed as Indians, the idea was paying homage to the past, but also um, uh, sort of ha making sure that traditions that are really strong in New Orleans would continue. This is actually one of the Mardi Gras parades, um, and it was real obvious that where the Ku Klux Klan had gotten their um, aesthetic from, although this is kind of reference to kind of Spanish Catholicism um, and French Catholicism in terms of uh, the, in this case, the way it's used. This is actually a tradition that before there was electric lights, they'd have these um, uh, torch bearers um, who would light the way in the parades. And then my friend Eric said, come on, we're gonna go to the beginning of the Zulu parade. And um, it was really interesting. This was like really early in the morning. And I remember somebody called me and he said, I said, I can't talk because it was both white and black people in blackface, which I had to take a little while to process. It was very interesting. So this idea of the kind of uh, uh, sort of sin and pleasure, always for pleasure, is always in some kind of conflict, although I think the only time this comes out is right on Mardi Gras Day. So one of the things that happens is the, uh, these uh, tribes that um, have been in existence in New Orleans for many years and actually began originally because black people were not allowed to mask during carnival. And so um, they, because uh, in, in celebration of the fact that the Native Americans had taken many of the slaves in the reservations and also coincidentally the fact that Buffalo Bill's Wild West uh, show had gone through New Orleans, um, the uh, many in different neighborhoods uh, people started these um, Indian tribes as a way to get over masking and also as, as, as I say a celebration and so people work on these suits all year um, and usually come out for the first day on Mardi Gras though but I've been there a couple days and if it rains they leave because they're not getting those suits damaged these are actually taken last year in 2019 on St. Joseph's Day, Super Sunday, which is the day after Mardi Gras when the, the um, uh, Indians come back out and kind of show their stuff. And it's interesting that I've noticed that the, the, uh, the garb has gotten much more sophisticated, much more global in terms of influences. Um, and that's been really interesting. And, and uh, so that's been interesting to sort of keep track of. And I think there was, I had a reference to this because uh, Beyonce did in the film. film this is on the evening on St. Joseph's Day. This is one of the second lines. You see someone jumping over the fence of a cemetery and this idea. The, the sort of, some people say that jazz was invented because um, the bands and the idea of a brass band actually has its roots in France. Um, the bands would, um, uh, play somber music on the way to the grave, and then they would improvise and play upbeat music on the way back um, at, to sort of celebrate the fact that their, the sort of uh, difficulties of their life are now over. This is um, Anton Ra Ramsey, and every year he wears a different kind of outfit. This one is actually has the names of a lot of either people or clubs that no longer existed. And it's interesting, I'm not gonna to get to it, but I sort of, after having started going to New Orleans, I went to Cuba because there's a whole direct line between Haiti and after the Haitian Revolution, a lot of the planters and some slaves moved to Eastern Cuba. And there's a whole carnival in Santiago that happens actually in July. And then many of the Cubans were exiled from, uh, not many of the Haitians were exiled from Cuba and settled in French Louisiana. So there's a lot of the aesthetics of Carnival and Mardi Gras had their basis, both Africa, uh, Haiti, Cuba, and um, also Louisiana. What's our time like? Let's see. I would just shout out my man, Chewy, who's doing it in Philly. Yeah. Well, this diaspora, I mean, I did, I should have included, I've seen uh, Zydeco and brass bands in the Bay Area on Carnival and also in France. 
um, I, we won't get to it, but the whole idea of this, the influence of New Orleans is definitely worldwide. And I'll just show you a couple. This was, I was able to go to, so they have these funerals where they carry the casket through the neighborhood with a brass band. In fact, the idea of the second line is the first line is the family and the casket. And the second line is the brass band and the followers. And as they go through the neighborhood, people come out. And so this parade was about 45 minutes long by the time it ended three hours later. And I think this whole idea that the, the line is blurred between the past and the present. This is a brass band who's just finished playing for a, a second line. And they're under that freeway on Claiborne Street. This is Jazz Fest. And that's Donald Harrison on the right, who's also an Indian chief. And his father was a, one of the main chiefs. And this is uh, Alan Toussaint with my book, and he was known for wearing these sandals. And then uh, Ban Banksy made a, a appearance in New Orleans not too long after Katrina. And we'll stop in a minute. I'm just sort of interested in this kind of tradition. This was actually an anti-violence uh, public art uh, in St. Rocks about a couple of years ago. If you know the show Treme, the um, couple of these guys were characters in that um, television series. This is actually Lee Circle um, that until about three or four years ago had a, a statue of Robert E. Lee, who is no longer there. I thought it was really interesting. And this is actually a production on the series Treme, which actually used uh, that photograph uh, to the ancestors of pouring out the libation in the opening credits of the first year. And this is uh, a book I did with Eric Porter, my colleague from UC Santa Cruz about music and culture in transition. And that's Uncle Lionel on the cover. And uh, I'll just stop with this in that this is um, a, a house that I stay in in Mini Montan in Paris. And I posted this picture and everybody says, are you back in New Orleans? Because the uh, shutters in New Orleans and in Paris look very much the same. This is um, the Room with a View, which is another series I did. And I think I will stop there, yes.